Hey everybody, Jason Cutter here. Welcome to another guest episode series of the Authentic Persuasion Show. I am so excited. I know I keep saying this. If you're a longtime listener, you hear me start every episode with that, and I don't care because it's true. I love having these kind of conversations because of where it fits in with what I enjoy and what I want to bring out there in the world as part of my mission is to help fill the world with authentic persuaders. And this podcast, this tagline for this show is to be a guide for helping sales professionals and teams close more sales and make more money, which means wherever this conversation goes, you're here for a reason. Hopefully you're tuning in, gonna take some notes. I'm very excited. As you've probably picked up by now, if you've been listening to episodes in this season, I am focused on speaking with professional sales education programs at universities. So some of the conversations are with professors, some are with directors of programs. And today I have a very fun, exciting guest and I'm super excited for her perspective on things. So on the episode today for this series, kicking off the first part here is Nalani Gruel. So she attended University of Houston She was a part of their sales program, then became a teaching assistant, and then was also a paid member of the university staff working as a marketing communication program manager. Now she's in a sales development role at a company called Starburst Data. So she went from being a student, not in sales program, going into the sales program, working with other students in the sales program to now being outside in the business where I was going to say the real world, and now also going back and working with students and coaching them and helping them with their competitions and with their program. So she's going to have amazing perspective on the program from the inside and the outside. Nalani, welcome to the Authentic Persuasion Show. Hey, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here today and talk about authenticity. And We have a ton of stuff to talk about. There's the basic questions and the structure of what I would like to talk about. And then there's your background and how you got here. Uh, Let's talk about that part and give you a few minutes to just talk about that path for you because you weren't planning on a sales career. You weren't planning on a sales program in college and we're just trying to figure out what you wanted to do. And then you ended up here. So, you know, what was that background? What was that path for you? And then also lead into what did you think of sales beforehand and how did that evolve? Okay, cool. Probably like many people listening and probably like both of us at the beginning, when I started college, I had no idea what I wanted to do in college. I feel like that's such a relatable feeling too, because you're young, 18. How do you have your whole life planned out yet? And I definitely did not. So I was in college for about four years. I went to community college first and worked two jobs, tipped my way through. I finally transferred to U of H. I knew I wanted to do something in business. I didn't know what that was going to look like for me. And to be honest, I was a first generation college student. So neither of my parents are in business. And my mom's a single parent waitress. So that was really the only like life I had known or I could see myself in. So I didn't see how I was going to fit into the business world, but I was going to try. So I went to U of H and I was sitting in this class. It's a required class at the University of Houston called Intro to Professional Selling. And there's this lady, Amy Vanderveer, talking. And she's one of those women that you meet and they come out and they're the most strong, commanding presence, but in the best way possible. And I was like, oh my gosh, she's awesome. Like, I love her immediately. Like, I want to be her. Like, I don't know what you do, but I want to be like that one day. And she gave a lot of airtime to the program for excellence in selling, which is the undergraduate program at SCI. And I remember sitting there next to my friend Colton and they were talking about an info session. And he was like, oh my gosh, like they're giving out a lot of scholarships. We should go to that. And at the very least, like it's free food. And I was a starving college student. So I never turned down free food. It's okay, let's go. And we go to the session and they're talking about it and they're talking about real life quotas that you have to hit. You sell a golf tournament in your first semester, your second semester, you sell career fair. And I was like, that is terrifying. They're using a CRM. They're making cold calls. And I was like, that means I have to do it. That's the only way I'm going to grow. I couldn't see that path for me. And I was like, okay, that means I have to do the things that scare me. So I joined the program as a student, went through the program and It was just as terrifying as I thought it was going to be, to be honest. (laughs) They were not lying. But through that, I gained a lot of confidence. And I started to see a path for me into the business world, not even necessarily in sales. 
particularly, but I could just see myself being in business. And then I went through the sales program and honestly, I started working as a teaching assistant during my time as a student in the sales program. And then when I graduated, they asked me to stay on full time as a program manager. So I stayed on. Um, so I did marketing communications and then I helped the students learn. So I would help them with their second semester, selling the career fair, doing role plays and stuff. And even then I did not think I was going to end up in a career in sales. And if you had asked me if I was going to be in tech sales, I would have told you a million dollars. No, thank God we didn't have that conversation because I don't have a million dollars. Um, one of the things that we do with our students is there's an optional class called key account selling. And this is one of the most impactful classes for a student if they take it. So you have to interview to get into it. We only allow 15 to 20 students every semester. I did this class as a student, but as a program manager, we take all these students on a trip. So a business trip, it's their job to set meetings with executives that are like vice president of sales. So one of the ones we met with is a CRO of my current company, Starburst Data. His name's Javier Molina. And we met with him in Austin and I just thought he was the coolest guy ever. Like everything he talked about, I got super energized. He talked about like how people have potential in sales and it, he would pick somebody with potential over like the world-class history of like business sales experience. And just the way his mind worked and I texted the professor I work with and I was like, oh my God, I want to work for this guy one day. And he messaged me on LinkedIn and was like, hey, if you ever want a job, let me know. So six months later, when it was my time to leave U of H, I messaged him. It's like, does that offer still stand? He said, yes. Every person I talked to at this company was like, made me leave feeling the same, like super excited, super energized. Like they were going to support me in like this transition into sales. So I was like, okay, let, let's do it. This is the company for me. So I ended up in tech sales wildly, like <laughs> never would have guessed it. And that's where I am today. So <laughs> one of the big things you said was that you thought the program was scary and that you did it because that was the whole point, right? Is to do things that scare you and or challenge you. And then you said it was as scary as you thought. What made it so scary? What was it about jumping into that or what happened in the class or what they made you do? They didn't make you do it, but what was so scary? Absolutely. So I was like... I was a little bit older in college. So I was around like 24 when I actually started the program or 23, somewhere in there. And you walk into this classroom first day and they talk to you about what are your goals? And you're like, okay, I mean, my goal is to get a job one day. I want to make money. Like, obviously I wouldn't <laughs> be here spending all this money if I didn't. And they're like, okay, cool. And then they start talking to you about CRM and Salesforce and cold calls and giving you a territory. So they assigned us a real territory and I had to reach out to those people, do research on them, call them, ask to set up meetings, ask them to literally buy products and services from me. And I was like, are you sure I'm allowed to be doing this? I'm a student. You're trusting me? Like, I was terrifying. So I made it through the first semester and I was like, Ooh, do I want to go back for round two? Like, I don't know. No, I did. I really did. But every semester it does get like a little bit more challenging because now you know all the things you're supposed to be doing. You're paying attention and you're like, oh, I did that the wrong way. Or you're just becoming more aware and the sales get harder. So your first semester, it's a little bit more transactional. And your second semester, you're selling a career fair. Um, so that's a little bit of a higher pay. Like you're actually like finding all this value for a company and getting them to commit to come recruit our students. And then I opted for a third semester where I did that key account selling class. And in that class, you're managing these partnerships between these companies that come recruit students. SEI is known for three things, like the degree program. So that would be like the undergrad students like I was. They also do MBA and higher level too, master's of science, but they are also known for research that so they do custom research programs with companies and they're known for their executive education. So not only are they training students in school, but they're also doing real life sales training with sales leaders across America, across the U.S. Actually worldwide, we do have companies that come from other countries as well. And so you manage that entire partnership for any of those companies that are getting one of those three services. For reference, those partnerships start at $10,000 and go over $100,000. So it's not like the small, like $500 to get a booth or to have some people come out and sponsor a golf tournament. Like those were like, you had to do a lot of research, a lot of communication. We literally physically sat across the table from an executive and slid them a contract for over $10,000 and asked them to sign at the end of the semester. We had to provide all that value. That was terrifying as a student <laughs> who literally couldn't even see themselves in business, let alone sitting across from 
a literal vice president of a company or like CEO of a company is wild. I love it. And what I will say is that's still scary. I think for a lot of people in sales and maybe not scared much as like nervous, what's going to happen. You don't know the outcome that moment there when you're, you know, wanting someone to move forward uh, and hire you or become a client. It's always that thought in your mind. That's, is this going to work? Did I do everything right? And did I set them up? So one of the things you talked about with the company you're at now, where they said that they would choose potential over other things, other factors. In looking at that, especially when we talk about the authenticity side, which is more about you and you as a salesperson than the sales part itself, why do you think that is? If you had to look at it in your experience, why are they so focused on potential versus other factors? I love that you asked that because this is one of the biggest things that drew me to this company is they look for people who are really coachable and people who like want to do well. And when Javier was explaining this to me, his whole thing was that he could hire somebody who's had an incredibly long tenured sales experience career. Yes. And they probably would do very well here, but they're also probably really set in their ways and they're probably not as coachable, but you hire somebody who has potential. Not only are they going to come in coachable, but they're going to come in hungry because they feel like they have something to prove and they're excited that you took a chance on them. And so I think that he could see like someone did that for him when he was younger and he's consistently done this throughout his tenure. And I can see it in all the people that I work with now. They're all had that potential and they're all excited to help each other. So not only are they going to succeed, but they're going to take everybody with them. Yeah. And the biggest challenge I've ever seen with that model for any leaders or business owners that listening or watching is <clears throat> coachable is amazing. It's so important. It's like the number one thing I look for, someone who's open and curious. When you hire someone who doesn't have the resume or the experience, you have to understand it's going to take a while, right? Like you're basically planting a seed and nurturing it to get a tree. It's going to take a while to get that return on it. One thing that's fascinating though, is in this world, and this is why I love this season of the podcast and these conversations, is that normally a company would have to spend a lot of time and money. It would take a while to get someone to some kind of proficiency and effectiveness. But when they're recruiting people out of a program that went to college and the college taught them the fundamentals, now it's a no brainer, right? Like an open, hungry individual with some level of education within sales, like all day, every day. The cool thing about what you just mentioned is that the Sales Education Foundation actually did like some reports on this and they came up with a statistic that when you hire a student that's gone through a sales program, so any sales program across the U.S., that companies find they have 30% less turnover and those people ramp 50% faster than people who haven't. Because one of the biggest things is a lot of people get into sales and they have no idea what to expect. And that's not what they expected at all. It's a lot harder than they thought it was going to be. Everybody thinks sales is like easy money and it's not that. So all these students come in with a background and they know what they're getting into. They're hungry. They're ready to go. I love it. And that is so true. And I think that's what's amazing about this opportunity. And obviously, as more schools have more programs and more people do that and have intention and then go out in the world, like they're having this foundation, right? This fundamental they're walking into it with. And I'm sure also weed some people out who are just like, yeah, I definitely don't want to do sales, which is also okay. And part of the experience. When we're talking about the authenticity side, you said that you never imagined you'd be in business, like just first generation going to college and with the, the work that your parents did, you're just like, that wasn't a thing. What did you think of salespeople, what it took to be successful versus what, where you're at now? Yeah, that's so interesting. Before I even went through PES and stuff, I did not think highly of salespeople for the most part. They always get that bad rep of the scammy car guy salesperson or like the mm -hmm. old movies. They all have the same kind of sleazeball guy who just wants to talk and talk until you're like, I will say yes to get you to stop. <laughs> and that was like very much my idea of it too. And the more I went through like that intro level class, the more I went through the program, the more I realized that it was about providing value and problem solving, and I love to problem solve. So I think that's one of the things that draws me into sales the most is I like to provide strong value to people. I always have, even when I was waiting tables, I always wanted to provide value in my service. And now that I'm like actually like 
in sales, like in the trenches, we call it SDR job is not easy. <laughs> it's so much different than I thought it was, but it's all about having empathy and relating to your buyer and understanding at the end of the day, they're a person too. And always looking to provide that value. And that's one of the big reasons I love my company is they're okay with us saying no, if we know it's not a good fit, but they teach us how to find and like how to source that. And I, I really like the process. I like being creative and finding those solutions, actually like bringing value to the table for somebody. Now you're coaching students. You were coaching before you left. You're mentoring them and guiding them. Is that pretty standard? of what you thought sales was about and then that transition into seeing what it is. You see a lot of that with your classmates. Yeah, absolutely. I used to ask in that intro level class before they go into PES, if they want to, the very first day, Craig McAndrews used to always ask, Hey, like how many of you have ever sold anything? And there, nobody would raise their hands. There was, I'm not selling stuff like what? And he's like, how many of you have ever been on a first date? And everybody raises their hands. He's like, that is a sales call. You're a <laughs> person on why they should be with you. And everybody's like, what? <laughs> and then we do another exercise where we ask them to describe salespeople and they come up with those words of like sleazy and stuff. And then it's fun to watch like people fall in love with the sales process. And you're right. It doesn't always happen. And that's okay too. And we always tell the students it might not be for you, but you'll take those skills with you any job you go to. Because we're talking about this, what do you think leads to either salespeople doing those things that people put on the list of stuff they don't like about salespeople? Or why does it feel like that about sales? Like, where is that coming from in your experience? Yeah, I think the whole idea behind it, like, why do they do maybe not the best practices for sales? A lot of people don't know. They just do mm -hmm. what they've always seen. A lot of companies don't have really great training for sales. So I think that's one part of it. And the second is, I think that when it comes down to the end of the day, a lot of times salespeople forget that it's not about them and it's about the person they're talking to. They forget to ask questions and they don't understand the buyer. And instead they just go into, how am I going to hit my quota? How am I going to get this meeting? How am I going to sell this car? How am I going to, and it, they make it all about themselves instead or about their product instead. So I think it comes down to those two things at the end of the day, like they're not being trained and not knowing any better. And then to like them making it about themselves and less about the person they're talking to. What do you think if we look at the other side in your experience so far, what are buyers looking for? Especially for my company, the product that I'm selling is very complex and we're literally helping people access like large quantities of big data to analyze. It's not a very transactional sell at all. And so what they want to know is that like you're genuinely providing them value, that you're asking them good questions and that you're not just there to sell them. So the minute you start like going off on the little rant and you're done, it's not going to happen. So the more you can ask questions and we actually had one of our clients tell us my favorite thing about working with you is that before you would even do a demo with us, you made sure you understood what my problem was and you verified. And then we went into a demo. So it wasn't ever like we were trying to do a fast sale to them. We were genuinely trying to see if we could provide you value. And if not, we will walk away. Interesting because I, I still see, and again, this goes to what you're saying where people don't know better who are in sales or they don't get training. Or what I see is people get hired on in a company and only get product training and think their job is to just mm -hmm. sell the product. And then they go into that demo and they don't ask questions and they're just basically promoting their solution, thinking that everyone's going to want it versus what you're saying. And so was there a moment or was there a part like of the process you went into before finishing school where it was about questions? It was about like that part there to get everyone to flip the switch in their mind. Yeah, absolutely. The entire time we're in that sales program, they're teaching you to how to ask better questions. And I think that's one of the skills that I left with that has helped me be really successful in my job so far is like learning how to ask good questions and also how to ask why is the most basic question you can ask is the one that people forget to ask the most. Why are you interested in this? Why did you download that? Why is that a big goal of yours? Because then you can dig into those second level questions. And one of the things that they teach us um, Carl Herman questions. Carl hates it when we say this, but he's a professor at U of H, had a long like sales career at like Halliburton at Oracle way back in the day, and then came to U of H to teach. 
but he teaches you the power of asking a good question and there's a format to follow. So it's a statement of fact. So if you do research, you find some interesting statement of fact that could relate to something that you can help solve. And then you ask a good question behind it. And what that does is it lets somebody know, like you are actively doing research, you're asking thought provoking questions. They want to answer those questions and you seem really intelligent and knowledgeable. And so they actually make us ask those questions. So we get like, every time we have a partner come and visit us or something, we'd have to write two of those questions before they got there that day. And then throughout the day, we'd be in charge of asking at least a question to get the thoughts going and get them engaged. I love it. And I know that we'll talk more about it in the second part, but I think that's just so fascinating to think about the value of that, not from a getting people to buy from you, but a being open and curious part like we were talking about. And then also what other people are expecting, which is the fact that hopefully you actually care about them and leaving them in a better place, right? Yeah, absolutely. And also like builds, like we always say people buy from people they know and trust that builds some kind of rapport. So they start to like you and trust you a little bit more. And then eventually you have to work your way up to buying. (laughs) Definitely. All right. So we're going to finish the part on authenticity here. I appreciate you being on. I'm super excited to talk more about the persuasion. I jumped the gun asking about that question, but I knew related to this for people who are listening or watching, if they want to connect with you, I know that you're on LinkedIn. That's actually how we connect. Anyone who knows me knows that I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. So Nalani Gruel, G-R-U-E-L, if they search for you, I think there's not too many Nalani Gruels on there. That's a good place to start. And then anybody, obviously, for the company you work for, starburst.io, they want to check that out and see what you're excited about helping people with. And that kind of company, it's not even promoting it and unpaid product placement here. It's what I love is supporting companies that are bringing people on board and training people and supporting them and looking for traits that are important for the company and ultimately for the buyer. So I love calling that out. So Lonnie, thank you for being on the first part here on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. And for everyone tuning in, make sure to catch the next two portions of our conversation coming up in the next two episodes. Appreciate everybody for being here and being a part of this journey of changing sales from dirty word that most people understand and relate to, that Nalani was speaking about, that the future people in sales start thinking about and then have to get their mindset shifted, hopefully, away from the gross, dirty part of sales that people really don't enjoy. It just keeps happening and perpetuating, but into a career that's respectable, that someday could actually be a profession while also helping you make money and close more deals. Until next time. Thank you for being here and thank you for helping fill the world with authentic persuaders.